You know, one of the things that we think about when we, um, when we come together for a celebration like this is we think about what God has been doing uh, through the church. And so one of the goals that we had this, uh, this time around was instead of thinking about how we could cast a vision that we think God would want uh, or what we would like God to do for us, and we do it in a little different way. We talk about how we can catch God's vision for the church and then let that change us so that God can do what he needs through us. So many times, uh, and I've been around a lot of different projects and campaigns and things like that, read about a lot of different ones, we'll throw things out like, uh, you know, God help us to grow to seven zillion uh, within the next three days and things like that. And then we pray and pray and pray. And then when that doesn't help, uh, happen, we go, God, what, what's the deal here? We prayed and we wanted you to perform for us and make this happen. And I think what God's more interested in is God's interested in our obedience and our catching his vision for us. Because when we have his vision in our heart and mind, then he can do everything he needs more than we can ask or imagine through the work, the power that's at work within it. So as we celebrate 150 years as a church family, I want to stop just for a second and say thanks for all you folks who have uh, come back uh, for after many years. I hope I remembered everybody's names. There might have been a few that I had to ask Alan about, about and then Alan said, well, I don't know who that is. So you've changed enough for me to, for me not to recognize your face, but I do know uh, how much I appreciate you being here to help us celebrate. It means so very much to us and the leadership of our team here. And I'm convicted by the reality that we continue to build on the foundation of those who have come before us. I want to thank Seth for putting together the video package that we watched. Uh, and he collected all the pictures. And of course, we've been taking pictures for years and years. Beth here is taking pictures today. And as I mentioned her, if you'd like to get a family picture, she'll be here and she'll take your family picture back in the fellowship hall, the one right behind the auditorium after our service today, if you'd like. And you can have a memory of that and then we can have a memory of you being here as well. But I'm convicted by the memory of all those who've helped build this church that we have here today. And our trip down memory lane reminded us that there was a lot of sacrifice and service that made possible what we enjoy here today. If they were here, I can assure you, they would be helping us build toward our future. And that's one of the reasons why we have the special project offering today. We're calling it our connection offering. If you'd like to help us get connected, not to one another, we do want to be connected to you, but we have this uh, need in our community as they have put in a new water treatment system here in Palestine. Uh, we had to get connected to that uh, here a week or so ago. And for the first time, and who knows, we, had, we know where the water from here is going. I can't guarantee you where we've known where it's been going for quite some time, but... Uh, we have this connection project. If you'd like to share in that, we have some envelopes in the back. You can share with us in that. Our goal is just to raise the resources that we need to pay for the expenses of running the lines and tapping into the treatment system the city has provided for us. But I know the folks that are here today, we like to sacrifice towards that. And I just think about all those in the past who have done everything to help build towards the future. The church in America is struggling, though. Is struggling to recover from losses experienced before the pandemic and during the pandemic. Statistics indicate that roughly half of those, I'll say that again, roughly half of those who attended church just five years ago no longer attend church. We could attempt to dissect why that is so, and many church experts are doing that. But what consumes my thinking is what we should do about it. I've been praying and reflecting and would like to offer this vision of our future which honors those who laid the foundation upon which we build and holds true to the gospel message found in Scripture. To keep it simple and easy to remember, I've used the initials PCOC as our guide. You have that on the back of your bulletin today. You can find the outline here that we'll be going through. This vision isn't about setting goals with numbers attached. It 
isn't asking God to conform and perform for us according to our hopes and dreams. It is more importantly a consideration of our understanding and obedience to God's plans for us as a church. And if you uh, are going to a different church now and you've moved on or moved away, these principles can be used in your life as well. It's about understanding God's plan and obeying it for His church. It calls us to get serious about God's specific instructions to us with the promise that if we are faithful to God's vision, He will bless us in the way He sees best according to what works out for all of us. You know that verse in Romans, God works all things together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose? I got news for you. It's His purpose, not yours, that He's working all things together for your good. He sees the best according to what is for us, and we need to trust Him. God's vision for His church always starts with one thing, and that is prayer. It always expects that we will connect to one another as members of the body of Christ. It always commands obedience from us following the example of the obedience of Jesus and His followers. It also demands compassion from us as we serve those in our church family and those suffering in this world. If we can catch God's vision, then Ephesians 3, 20 through 21 tells us what will happen. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen? Amen. Now, notice there, it keeps going forever and ever throughout all generations. I can't imagine that Brother Smith, when he helped establish this church 150 years ago, could foresee what our church has come, become. But I think he was driven by the restoration promise that we all follow that is found in this scripture and that we can bring glory to God through the church and through Christ Jesus generation after generation forever and forever. So let's catch God's vision for PCOC. Let's start with the letter P. Palestine. The prayer warriors who served on our prayer chain over the years were constantly sharing prayer requests. I thought it was kind of interesting when we first moved here. Someone handed me a list and said, this is our prayer chain. I thought, okay, what's a prayer chain? I, I knew what a prayer chain was in a sense, but I want to know what our prayer chain was going to be. And it was a list of uh, several, mostly women, I think it was all women, and uh, they said, whenever a prayer request comes in, you're supposed to call the person at the top of the list. So for many years, it was Mae Fraley. For many years, it was Lois Nichols. And Lois, it's really good to see you here today. You, you've you been around here probably as long as anyone. And uh, thank you for your service and, and your family's service to the Lord. Just thank you, Lois. I appreciate that. So I'd call one of them, and then they would either... And if they had a prayer request, they would call me, and then I would call them back and tell them that prayer request. No, just, we just uh, share that. Then they would pass it down the, the line to the seven or eight ladies that are on the prayer chain. So we were constantly making prayer requests. Like today, Carol said, could you pray for me? I'm going to have a heart ablation, you said, in November. So we would put that at the top of our prayer chain and work its all the way down. So I'm just going to tell you now, now you all know, pray for Carol as she has her heart ablation. Sometimes these requests are urgent, and sometimes they were just ordinary daily requests. Ephesians chapter 6, 18 instructs us, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So if we're going to catch God's vision as far as the church is concerned, I think it always has to start with prayer. And so for us, and I shared this with the elders the other night, we are going to institute these things will be more intentional about following this instruction from the Lord in the future. Our first step will be to revive the prayer gatherings that we used to have before our church service each Sunday. Jack, you remember those? Jack, where are you? Oh, there you are. Jack, you remember? We'd go back and we'd sit in the room and we'd go through our prayer requests and uh, we'd pray for a lot of different things. And so one of the things we want to do is revive that prayer gathering. And so uh, starting next Sunday morning at uh, about 10 minutes till when, before church starts, um, we'll find a room in the back. You'll find me. There'll be a, a sign on the door, prayer room. You can come in and you can pray, which won't be long. 
But we want to pray for the standing things. We want to pray for our church, pray for growth, pray for things like that. Pray for our worship service. Pray for the preacher as he preaches. Pray for people as they come. But also we'll offer special prayer requests that people have. And I remember for many years it would be just Jack, Tom, and I back there praying. And uh, something incredible just would happen whenever you would offer those things up to the Lord. You weren't sure what was going on out here, but you'd come out and then we'd see God be doing His work. So we're going to ri- revive that, start that again. The other thing we used to do, that one, uh, one of the methods that we used that we're going to revive, is uh, do you all remember when we used to put dots on our watches? This is back before cell phones, or maybe there were cell phones, but they were not that popular. But we gave little dots to everybody that would fit in the middle of the watch or top of the watch. And at noon each day, when you looked at your watch and you saw the dot, it was to remind you to do what? Pray. Now, we're not going to give you any dots because uh, they'd fall off whatever you got anyway. But everyone has these phones now that reminds them to take their medication, to get up in the morning, to get to this thing or that thing. And so what we're going to do is ask you to be part of our new prayer chain team of prayer warriors who sign up and you receive text messages when there are important prayer needs that are coming up. And then at noon each day, you will pray for the standing things that we'll have listed and those prayer requests that come to you via text. My text number is 937 So if you contact me with that number, oh, it's there. Thanks, Seth. He's got it on the, there it is. Write it down. If you'd like to be a part of this prayer warrior chain, it doesn't matter if you uh, come to church here or not. If you've, you're, you go, you live outside of town, you still want to be a part of our prayer team, then you text me and I will text, back, text you back with further instruction. And as always, we want to continue to pray for those who call for special prayer. Over the years, we've gone to different places and we've uh, put oil on people's heads, prayed for them, according to James 5, 13 through 16. So we want to be more intentional about our prayer. What about C, PCOC? Let's talk about the first C, connection. PCOC has a rich history of connection, connection in the church family and with the community around us. One of the things that I found out early on is that if they connected with the preacher they liked, they'd hide his car or do something like that. Some of you might remember the story. Was that Harry Pitts that you guys hid his car? Does anybody remember that? I can't remember. We've had resurrection breakfasts. We used to do them at sunrise. You guys remember the sunrise services? Oh, wow. It was technically sunrise, you know, find out when the sun's coming up and we'd be, uh, we'd have our choir up here singing cantatas and uh, then we'd have breakfast and then, uh, then often we'd have, that would be the end, but then sometimes we'd have services afterwards. Our annual Thanksgiving meals, oh, our, le- our legend, there's a picture of when we had back here in this, uh, the smaller fellowship hall, we had over 200 people stuffed in there one Easter or one Thanksgiving for a Thanksgiving meal. Nobody seemed to care that we we're all packed in. We try to give you more space today for the meal today. But back in the day, you, you, get, you can uh, barely move your seat out in order to sit down or to sit back down. Our Labor Day ice cream social transformed in many ways over the years. But the idea was to bring the community together to support our fire department. And one time, we even included the rescue squad in that. All of that, over the years, has just been about connection. Connection is in our, is in our DNA as a church. But other matters seem to have taken priority in everyone's lives for some reason. And those types of things have become less uh, participated in. So we want to be more interactive as it concerns our connection in the years to come. We learned from Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 in our deep dive into Hebrews this year what our interaction must accomplish. It says there, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. 
We've been trying to improve our online resources over the last uh, 18 months or so so that we can interact and take advantage of the social media services, but studies show people still long for person-to-person -person connection. So we're reactivating our ministries which allow us to connect person-to-person, face-to-face. We'll address these needs for our adults and for our teens and for our children. Let's talk about obedience, PCO. This church always has had a rich history of gospel preaching and teaching, and I'm thankful Seth listed all those from like 1960 and beyond. He said, well, what about the ones before? Should we list them? And I said, I don't think anyone's old enough to remember before then, so no, just do the, the more current ones. We didn't really have a lot of pictures of the ones previous to that. We've always had great preachers, always had wonderful teachers. And we have this goal of bringing as many people as we can into the salvation of Christ Jesus and to discipleship under his name. In the past, yearly revivals were held. I keep hearing about the revival of, was it 1952? Was that the big famous revival? I think Doug Fraley wrote about it on uh, Facebook. And if you haven't read uh, some of Doug's uh, comments, uh, be sure and check those out. He's got some wonderful memories about the Timothys that went out from the church here and about how he came to know the Lord in the small church here in Palestine. We've had Bible studies, weekly Sunday schools, youth groups. All our building additions were driven by the idea that we needed space so that we could reach out for years to come. We know the key to salvation is obedience, as described in Hebrews 5, 8 through 9, which says, Son though he was, talking about Jesus, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. We want to obey him. We want to take advantage of that source of eternal salvation he provides. So it's time for us to renew our commitment to integrity as it involves our preaching and teaching, but calling for people to be obedient to Jesus as the source of their eternal salvation. The focus of preaching and teaching will be Jesus, and in addition to maximizing the value of our online presence, we must renew our on-site offerings in the form of studies and support ministries. We have an incredible facility blessed to us by those who believed in the ongoing outreach of this church and before you're done today, if you join us for our lunch, you'll go the breadth of the building and you'll see the different transitions in the building over the years. We have an incredible facility blessed to us and we must renew those programs which honor that belief and take advantage of this incredible facility that we have. PCOC, the last C, compassion. The Palestine Church of Christ has always demonstrated a heart of compassion in the form of service to this community and service to each other in the name of the Lord. Remember the food pantry we used to have out here in this little closet in the hallway? People would drop by and they could get peaches from 1947 and take them home. Now, we tried to keep the food pantry stocked with fresh stuff, but every once in a while something would sneak through. I think eventually we gave everything to the Boy Scouts, and then they handed out uh, some things with their projects. We've fed hundreds of families over the years. Our Benevolence Fund has paid for gas, utilities, groceries, medical bills for our church family, members of the community, and sometimes even transients looking desperately to help get home. Sarah reminded me of the story of the man with the tumor on his tongue. She said, is that true? Was that true? Am I remembering that correctly? And I said, yeah, there was a guy. He came knocking on the parsonage door one day, and when I opened the door, it was like, you know, um, like a Halloween mask his face was. And he had a tongue that wouldn't go into his mouth because he had a big tumor on his tongue. We invited him in, and um, I think Rab was the chairman of the elders at the time, and so I called Rab, and, and uh, we talked about some things that we could do to help him. We fed him dinner, and he uh, spent the night, and then Rab and I took him over to the Greyhound bus station, or one of the bus stations over in Richmond, and sent him home to Kansas. And then, um, then uh, somehow this story about a man stopping at churches with a tumor on his tongue started to pop up on the Internet, 
and we wonder if he was really an angel and we were just unaware. See, the idea of Palestine, and I think about Rab and May when I think about hospitality, they'd let anybody stay in their home. They would feed them a meal, take care of them, and even allow their homes to be used for people who served here. Colossians 3, 12 through 14 reminds us, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Driven by love and hope for unity, this church family has served each other and this community faithfully. So it's time for us to reestablish specific service ministries to our church family and community. It isn't necessary to do what we've done before. We need to be creative, and those ministries served a purpose, but we can unleash the compassion and love that's bound up in the heart of our church family now in the form of compassionate service in different ways. We must be intense about this because there will always be many excuses given for not trying. We live in a cynical and selfish world. But we must unleash the intensity of compassion in our people using the resources and facilities we enjoy as a church. God's vision for His people has always been for them to be people of prayer, for them to connect to one another through fellowship, discipleship, evangelism, for them to be obedient to Him, and for us to be compassionate servants of one another. The incredible thing about God's vision for the church is that it works in every situation, every circumstance, and in every time frame. And as we intentionally revive our prayer ministry and interactively reactivate our connections to each other and with integrity renew our commitment to obedience to Jesus and with intensity reestablish opportunities for compassionate service, God can and will bless this church in our time, in our circumstance, in our, search, in our situation. Remember, to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to His power that is at work within us. We're deep diving into Hebrews this month. It states, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were committed for. These were all committed for their faith, yet none of them received what he had promised, since God had been planning, or since God had planned something better for us, that only together with us would they be made perfect. That from Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, and then Hebrews 11, 39 through 40. You see, it is by our faith that we believe in God's vision for the church, and that connects us all the way back to the very beginning when His people live by faith through every situation and every circumstance and every dysfunction and every drama, by faith they lived through that. And they prayed and they connected and they obeyed and they showed compassion. And we believe God will bless us so that we can make perfect the promise of God He has made for those from Abel to us. You see, what they did, they were not able to experience the full ramifications of the promise, but along with us, we fulfill what it was that they lived in by faith. We must pursue it together and we'll receive what God has promised. You know, people might wonder why we keep on praying, connecting, obeying, serving compassionately. For 150 years, that's just been in our DNA. It's something that I've learned to appreciate in the 32 years that I've been here. We celebrate those who by faith, they kept praying. They kept reaching out and connecting with one another. They kept obeying and they kept serving compassionately. And we have the opportunity today to continue that commitment wherever we are in this church or whatever church we're involved with. Would you please just join me in prayer to that particular end? Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to cast a vision for us that comes from your word. And I pray for us as a church family as we move forward after 150 years and celebrating. We're 150 and counting. We'll just keep serving, Lord, until you return. You let your son come back and receive us unto himself. Father, we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to be a small part of a grand history 
that we get to be a small part of many, many people, hundreds of people who have served the Lord here faithfully and have taught us and left this great legacy for us. And I pray, Lord, that as we continue to celebrate here in um, our fellowship meal, that we'll be reminded, Lord, that we never stop being family. No matter where we go, where we might be from, whatever we might be doing right now, we all have that connection right here. Maybe we were baptized here when we were little. Maybe we came to our first vacation Bible school here. Maybe our parent was a leader in the church. Maybe we participated in some program that drew us closer. But whatever is our connection, whatever has brought us here today, Lord, we give glory and we give honor to you for all those who've served so faithfully and set a wonderful example for us. And we just make it our prayer, our hope, our goal to continue in that pattern that they have set for us and to follow the principles that they have laid out for us. Lord, we love you so very much and we're so thankful for you. And we know this church might seem small and insignificant to the rest of the world, but it is mighty and important in heaven. Help us to continue to see that and serve in that hope and in that truth. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And again, let all God's people say, Amen.